This video is sponsored by Raycon. In the wake of the latest Pokemon generation being released earlier this week, I noticed this image going viral on Twitter, and it caused chaos in the comments down below. The image in question claims to demonstrate the differences between Generation 1's more realistic and detailed Pokemon design philosophy and the newly released and somewhat smoother Generation 9, within which it also presents possible smoother, more modern designs for Generation 1's older Pokemon like Krabby, Pidgey, and Vulpix. However, while this post suggests that modern Pokemon designs have trended in a more geometrically simple direction, there are plenty, and let me emphasize, of exceptions to this proposition with of even more simple examples stemming from Generation 1's catalogue, with the likes of Oddish, Grimer, Muck, Ditto, and Voltorb to name but a few. I mean, folks are getting angry at the idea of there being a Flamingo Pokemon in Generation 9 that's just a Flamingo, but guys, let's face it, Gen 1 had Seal, and Dugong, and Eevee, and Horsey, and Pidgey, and okay, you get the point. These are hardly standouts in design mastery. I mean, Krabby is just a crab, and Snorlax is just a bunch of circles. Despite this, however, the image that went viral fascinated me. People have been fighting over what makes Pokemon look like Pokemon for over a decade now, and having failed to figure out a solution in my previous video, I mean, that video was awful, I took this as a sign that I should give it another shot. This time, I would succeed. This time, I would try to get to the bottom of what exactly was the difference between Generation 1's pocket monsters and the latest designs to be added to the now overflowing catalog of modern modern Pokemon. And to do this, I started to look at Pokemon. Hundreds of Pokemon. Over a thousand Pokemon, all in the name of science. And today, I would like to report my findings while getting some artists on board to help me redraw some of the most modern designs as if they were drawn by Ken Sugimori himself during the 90s. But in order to do that, I need to assemble some trustworthy artists. And as it turns out, the person I saw sharing this post originally wasn't the original artist behind the image in question, but is a fantastic artist into and of herself and has even worked on the modern remake of Animaniacs, which probably means she's a little overqualified for this job. Needless to say, I was happy to see Ashley join the team. However, I knew that in order for this video to become a reality, I needed to find the artist behind this image. And let me tell you, they were way way more difficult to find than you might think, as I discovered this wasn't the only time this image caught fire online. For over two hours, I scoured the deepest, darkest recesses of the web for evidence of this artist, all to no avail. I tried Google image search, which led me to useless areas of Pinterest, DeviantArt, and Reddit posts from one year ago, three years ago, and as many as six years ago in some cases. We were dealing with a very old post indeed, and eventually the trail ran cold when my final clue led me into the Pokemon section of none other than 4chan. <laughs> which meant that it was possible in theory that the original artist posted this artwork anonymously. And so, defeated, as a last ditch effort, I placed the bounty on the head of this artist in question and challenged those that followed me on Twitter to seek them out. And I kid you not, within like 10 minutes, they found them. Simply because they had referenced an image in a tweet claiming to be the artist some time ago. In other words, we found them. And with that, Vivink Art joined the crew, meaning it was time to redraw some modern Pokemon and answer the question, what makes Gen 1 Pokemon look like Gen 1 Pokemon? And when does a Pokemon stop looking like a Pokemon? These are really difficult, somewhat philosophical questions to answer and maybe more complicated than you might think. For instance, Take this drawing of Rookie D from Gen 8 drawn by Ashley. The reason I chose Rookie D to start off this video with is that it isn't really what many would assume might be considered as an offender of breaking some sort of styling conventions and truth be told, as a fan of some of the earlier generations of Pokemon, I really like Rookie D. I think he's cute and has a bit of edge to him too. However, in searching for the answer to my question, why are people arguing about the current generation designs, I thought this might be an interesting area to kick off my search. You might notice from the beginning that Ashley has opted to fundamentally change the shape of Rookie D to match the other two first forms and shapes of Pidgey and Spearow. In addition to that, following the philosophy, she offers Rookie D more pronounced talons, greater detail to the feathers, and makes certain layers like the black feathers on the chest less of a geometric shape on the Mon's chest, but instead its own collection of feathers itself layered on top. However, these choices, while great, weren't necessarily the most interesting to me. As you can see from the color of the shapes used, while there are clear differences, most of these attributes are more detailed renderings of attributes that exist in the modern iterations. These changes, while I'm sure they are the most noticeable, 
aren't necessarily the most interesting change in my estimation, because amidst all of these sort of stylistic changes, there was one aspect of the Rookie D design that we had to fundamentally change, the eyes. All right, that's a good start. This time, let's take a look at something that just came out. Let's tackle our first Generation 9 starter, Fue Coco. With Fue Coco, Ashley decided to revise the shape of this little guy just a tad, taking inspiration from characters like Charmander and Totodile, and truthfully, I think she does an amazing job with this one. Speaking on the drawing process, she said, I wanted to keep him as friend-shaped as possible and took inspiration from both Totodile and Charmander. Early on, when I first saw the design, I always thought his evolutionary path was going to be more hot pepper themed and while that didn't really pan out, I wanted to bring that theme back as it fit him really well. I also adjusted his face to appear more as a mask or skull instead of just a marking. Again, as examined with older Pokemon designs, I tweaked the proportions for a larger body and slightly smaller head. And I think the finished results look honestly amazing amazingly faithful to the classic look. Amazing work, Ashley. And fittingly, I think next should be this little guy's final form, Skeledurge. From a design standpoint, I think Skeledurge offers a lot to look at concerning modern Pokemon designs, though it is difficult to fully understand given there's very little official artwork for this character out now as of making this video. However, I think Vivink does an incredible job with this one though, taking elements from the current designs and reimagining and repurposing them to more closely resemble the classic aesthetic. However, I think one of the coolest aspects from the modern designs came from the shape of the Firebird on the snout of this creature rock, obviously taking inspiration from real life birds hanging out in the mouths of crocodiles in the wild. But an aspect that really makes this feel Gen 1, I think, are the shapes used for the fire itself with Vivig's interpretation taking a much more angular look to them. Couple that with a terrific color scheme and you have for yourself one brilliantly fun design. Exceptional work, Vivig. This looks awesome. But let's keep the ball rolling with these starters and take a look at Ashley's redesign of Sprigatito. Thankfully for this kind of Pokemon design, there are a lot of other characters one can take inspiration from. Pokemon such as Meowth, Persian, and Eevee. In her approach, Ashley decides to reduce the size of the head from the original considerably, changing the eye shape and pupil design to offered greater detail to the feet and most obviously having taken inspiration from Eevee she fluffed up and accentuated the fur on Sprigato itself resulting in one of the best looking reimaginings I've seen fantastic work Who's that Pokemon? The holidays are upon us, and with that comes the stress of what to buy our loved ones. Thankfully, Raycon has made this easy with holiday gift guides for everyone. I'm a huge fan of the Everyday Earbuds personally and often use them for listening to podcasts while working, but they're also just as great for exercise and walking your dog. Regardless of whether you pick up their earbuds, headphones, or speakers, they offer premium sound, useful features, and almost custom comfortable fit. Best of all, some offerings have up to 54 hours of battery life. The speakers are definitely a great choice over the holidays, if you're someone who loves to party. While they sound fantastic, what really makes them attractive this season is their price. At half the price of other premium audio brands, they're a fantastic option for those looking to save money. For the next month, Raycon will have a countdown to Christmas with a new pop-up flash deal for you to take advantage of every single day. So click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com forward slash not marked to get 15% off site-wide with code HOLIDAY. Like I said, there will also be new pop-up deals every day during Raycon's countdown to Christmas, and I'll try to keep the description box updated with the latest offers. But just so you know, you can always go to buyraycon.com forward slash not mark to get the best deals available on Raycon. Is that f***ing Frieza? Now, seeing as we've only got one starter left to give the 90s treatment to, we may as well see how Ashley does with Quaxley. Interestingly, Ashley said Quaxley was the toughest one she had worked on. She said, I wasn't too sure about how to approach him because adding more detail to him like the other bird Pokemon of the generation just wouldn't fit. It wouldn't work with his theme. I took heavy inspiration from Farfetch'd and Psyduck, but honestly, at the end of the day, what made Quaxley so hard was his character theming just didn't feel like something they would have done in Gen 1. A Pokemon themed after a kid who loves to dance is such a fun idea for a starter, but it's really out of place in Gen 1, oddly enough. I tried to at least maintain his hair and pull the proportions to be more 
subdued, the biggest change being the wings. Typically, bird wings in Generation 1 are fairly detailed, with Psyduck being an outlier. I did try to give him arms akin to Psyducks, but that felt absolutely wrong. Quaxley is definitely a Pokemon meant for newer generation art styles. Amazing work, Ashley, and thank you so much for participating in this video. All right, so we've seen a lot of designs. It's time to close things out with Vivink, and he has something very special for us with this one by drawing the entire evolutionary line of Frigibax. Three Pokemon from starting form to middle form, all the way to the second evolution form, which looks incredible. Spoiler alert. So let's get this one started. Now, while these three guys are being drawn, I think the conclusion I came to regarding the differences that exist between these two diametrically opposed generations are far more subtle than you might think. This isn't, of course, to suggest that Generation 1 and Generation 9 don't have design differences, however. I do sincerely think that there are measurable differences to these generations, differences that don't imply that one is better than the other, but just the natural evolution of a style over the course of almost 30 years at this point. Every long-running series undergoes stylistic changes stemming from that same root philosophy. Ken Sugimori, one of the main artist behind the original 150 still works on the designs of the new Pokemon to this very day, and it really isn't unheard of for styles to change with the culture and requirements of the medium they are preparing for. I mean, Akira Toriyama when he was drawing Dragon Ball in the early 90s boasted designs that looked exceptionally different to that which he ended the series with in the Boo Saga. These changes came about both due to the natural evolution of his tastes and due to what the story demanded from him at the time. I can't personally speak to what the Pokemon series needed to adapt to with regards to the game design, though it's obvious that the game have had to undergo massive differences visually over the last 25 years, as they should. The point is, as a series and story develops, the style which these characters are drawn in will inevitably change, whether it be through natural stylistic progression as seen in Ken Sugimori's designs, or with slight alterations to existing designs like with the modern interpretation of the Animaniacs which Ashley worked on. However, concerning the images here, Vivink absolutely is killing it with these redraws of these characters with Baxcalibur, perhaps highlighting something I personally didn't like about the new games myself. Remember in the old games when you'd look at your Pokedex and the Pokemon and they'd be doing some dynamic pose that accentuated who those Pokemon are? Well, now they look, I don't know, less dynamic. I mean, Baxcalibur in this game avatar looks like he's being called to the principal's office, like he's being scolded, he's just standing up at attention. And this redraw just really highlights that for me. Now, big thanks to both Ashley and Vivink for their wonderful work and contributions to this video. Their socials are in the description if you want to see more from them. I do have two other redraws that Vivink did actually, but if you want to see them, you'll have to head over to my TikTok at Totally Not Mark. I've posted one of these redraws already, and the next one will be going up tomorrow. I've been posting on TikTok all week, and it's actually pretty fun. It's an easy way of me making shorter content that doesn't always make it into videos, like this one, for instance, of me correcting someone about their Dragon Ball take. So if you'd like to see me doing that or some of their Pokemon designs, feel free to check out my TikTok at Totally Not Mark. Links in the description. In conclusion, now that we've seen a bunch of different modern Pokemon redrawn and in the process learned a lot about the design philosophy of not just Pokemon, but a host of other series in a similar position, what's my takeaway? Well, earlier last week, I posted two questions to my Twitter. The first being, which Pokemon generation had the best designs? And the second being, which is the best designed Pokemon. And the responses to those tweets just tell the story in a nutshell. You can certainly prefer one over the other, I personally do, and I think that's inevitable. However, the mistake that people often make, myself included, is that there's an objective way to measure how great a design is, when there's not. In this video, I highlighted one thing, that the design shapes used have indeed changed or become or varied. That is neither a good nor a bad thing necessarily just a difference. Unlike the slow changes Dragon Ball experienced over its tenure, when it comes to generational releases like Pokemon offers, I think they live up to their name. There are of course hundreds of thousands of you out there who have played all of the games throughout your lives, but I'm also certain that there are those that simply aged out of the games around the third generation, and when they tried to pick up them again for the modern stuff, it felt more alien to them than those that aged up with them. Sort of like going from the first three arcs of Dragon Ball and plopping yourself into the middle of Dragon Ball Super. It would of course feel alien and feel entirely different aesthetically. And given the cyclical nature of Pokemon itself in that younger generations tend to pick up the newer games as their gateway and older fans tend to drop off from time to time, it stands to reason that the most significant factor that dictates what makes a Pokemon a Pokemon to someone is an entirely personal experience. The same way someone who loves Gen 1 might look at Gen 8 as something that's lost its edge, someone who started with Gen 8 might just as rightly look at the past in Gen 1 and see something lacking that which they identify as something specific specifically Pokemon. A few years ago, I made a pretty bad video about Pokemon designs. And while I 
do think there are stylistic differences between the likes of Generation 1 and Generation 9. I don't think this is always a bad thing and far more subjective than others might suggest. It has nothing to do with simpler shapes necessarily, or how animalistic other designs might appear. It doesn't have to do with how they are all coloured, or even the philosophical differences in approach certain characters have been designed with. I think it's entirely down to how differently the term Pokemon has been defined in each of our individual minds, informed by our first glimpses into the series we all know and love. For me, it was looking at that game cover of the red version case with the classic design of Charizard in 1998. But for some of my friends, it was seeing someone playing Pokemon Emerald on the playground, or seeing a Generation 8 trading card. The best thing about Pokemon is the variety it provides us with. And in that same way, I think it should be okay to love and appreciate what was, and have fun redesigning what currently is, while giving it the respect it deserves. I've been Totally Not Mark, and thank you so much for watching.